thanks, Claire, for that really nice introduction. It's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, this building wasn't here when I was uh, here when Claire moved, so it's nice to see a new building as well and uh, meet new people today. Um, so in time for, just in time for Thanksgiving uh, and for people flying home, uh, today I'm going to be talking about work that um, some recent work we've been doing on air traffic problems, but this is really my homage to uh, Stanley Kubrick, Dr. Strangelove, uh, and really my journey in sort of learning how to embrace delays and try to work with uh, enjoying every aspect of air travel, but at the same time doing something about the painful uh, pieces. Um, this is uh, so joint work with uh, several people. Uh, my student, Karthik Gopalakrishnan, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about the work that we've been doing in the first part of this talk, uh, along with Richard Jordan, who used to be at MIT Lincoln Lab and is now at uh, Sound Health, which is a healthcare startup, and also with uh, Bala Chandran, who is a co-founder of a company that uh, we have, um, trying to um, commercialize some of the work in predicting air traffic delays so that to help uh, passengers around the world. Okay, so with that, why air transportation? Well, uh, a lot of people fly, and there's a lot of pain as well. Um, um, in terms of just sheer numbers, um, you know, a little over 7 billion PM passengers got on board of uh, flights some, sometime over uh, the past year. Um, worldwide, it's a large number of flights. It's a little more than 88 million flights per year uh, worldwide. In the US, if we think about commercial flights, like um, airline flights, there are somewhere between 25 and 30,000 flights a day currently, and this is projected to grow. Um, the increasing demand, of course, there's been increasing amounts of pain as well. So if we think about how much does do air travel traffic delays cost, um, delays are estimated to cost somewhere between 30 and 40 billion dollars a year. So this is just waste in terms of economic cost. A lot of it is direct operating cost to the airlines, including uh, large amounts of jet fuel that get burnt when flights are delayed. Uh, and there's a significant environmental impact as well. And so a lot of the work that uh, um, I've done over the past few years has been motivated by, can we do something about reducing both the pain that the passengers see, but also the environmental impact of uh, uh, air travel and the waste stage, at least, of delays. Um, now, there are several things around the world that are being done in terms of modernizing to improve the way the system uh, works. Uh, these next generation air transportation systems try to leverage new technologies, and these technologies include things like better sensing in terms of surveillance so that we can track aircraft, but also better computation and better optimization and control mechanisms so that we can operate uh, better inherently. And this is really, there's two things which are almost a paradigm shift that we are seeing in terms of uh, the air tra transportation system now. One is that um, the demand that we see in terms of the aircraft, the, the aircraft are beginning to look different. And by look different, I mean that you, it's not just that the designs of you know, the airframes are different, but the level of autonomy that we see is changing as well. And a lot of people at Berkeley are working on you know, the unmanned, um, the UAV, the unmanned air vehicle side of things as well. Um, but really, if we think about decision support for controllers to manage increased levels of demand, uh, there's the automation. So how do we build be better decision support so that um, the system operators can manage this new demand and increase levels of demand? So that's another uh, aspect of this problem as well. Um, so what do we do to address these problems? And this is just in terms of general philosophy of what we do. I, I'd like to think that we try to design practical algorithms for these systems, like air transportation. Um, what do we want these algorithms to do? Well, we want the system to work better, and by which we mean we want the system to be more efficient. And we'll come back to this notion of efficiency, but clearly what is efficient for a passenger is not necessarily efficient for an air traffic controller, is not necessarily efficient for an airline. There are different metrics of efficiency that we can think about. Uh, the second is we would like it to be robust, because currently in the system, when something goes wrong in one airport on one side of the country, it starts impacting the rest of the system as well. So we want to prevent these cascades of delays that tend to occur. And we want to do this while maintaining, um, in the US, what are incredibly high levels of safety. So we want to maintain the levels of safety that we see, at least. And 
doing these things, achieving these objectives is hard because, well, there are several barriers. One is there's a lot of uncertainty in the system. And weather is going to be a key one where uh, we don't know exactly what the weather is going to be like, which impacts, you know, what uh, aircraft can do, which in turn impacts delays and so on. Uh, the second is there are human operators. There are human air traffic controllers, there are human uh, pilots. So there are a lot of different decision makers who are human beings, and the human factor is going to be essential to integrate into any of the algorithms we build. And the third is that these human beings or these different entities compete with each other. Ultimately, these if you think about commercial air travel, airlines are operating these flights, and the airlines have their best interests at heart for each of them. So they're each acting as selfish agents competing with each other in the system. Um, so to try to overcome these challenges, what can we do? Well, there's one thing that's changed in the past 10 years or so, and that is there's an increasing amount of real-world operational data that we have. And so the question is, can we firstly use leverage large amounts of operational data to do things? And we try to do that. What do we try to do? Well, we use this data to build simple, physically inter interpretable models. And um, I should, at some level, stress on this, because um, it is important when you have so many human stakeholders and decision and policy makers there that you're able to explain what models are doing. And so really, one thing we realize is that it's almost like Occam's razor. You want to have a simple thing where you can explain to people what the system's doing and that the models are reasonable and are doing things that you would expect, or if they're counterintuitive, why, right? So the explanation becomes important. And we want to use these to develop and implement scalable algorithms. Scalable because we know that the demand is going to grow. You know, Some estimates are demand is going to grow up to two times the current levels, so you want to be able to include larger and larger numbers of uh, aircraft as well. So ultimately, you use the algorithms like this and develop decision support for the um, human decision makers or stakeholders. And ultimately, I, I think this goes back to things that Berkeley has done for many, many years, which is it's not just, I think we've gone beyond just the cyber and physical parts of these systems. It's really becoming the cyber and the physical and the human element. And can we bring them all together to build better uh, systems that work better? Um, so with these rough philosophical goals in mind, today I'm going to be talking about um, two pieces that are related in that they're about delay. Um, the first is really um, um, how do things propagate. So it's uh, some work that we've been doing in understanding the dynamics of delays. And in particular, uh, I'll talk about why this is a good abstraction. But we, if you have networks which have topologies that are switching, can we use models like that? Can we learn those models and use them to predict how delays propagate? And then the second piece is once we sort of understand how they pro propagate, trying to figure out what can we do about it. So how do we mitigate these impacts of delays? And here I'm going to talk about some work that we've been doing on very large scale uh, optimization algorithms for a problem that's known as air traffic flow management. Um, so to start with you know, the bottom line, which is delays propagate. Um, the good way to see this is this visualization of data uh, on a day when there's bad weather. So I'm Hopefully, you at the back can make out the little gray dots. The little gray, OK. So each gray icon that you see, which is shaped like an aircraft, is an aircraft. Um, this is a day in uh, 11 years ago, in 2005, when there was weather in the Chicago area. So there's weather that's pretty much only in the Chicago area. Later in the day, there was a little bit uh, down south in DFW. Um, as the day progresses, some of the aircraft are going to turn yellow. So the aircraft that turn yellow are going to have more than 15 minutes of delay, whereas the aircraft that turn red are going to have more than an hour of delay. So we see that initially because the weather is here, you know, you have a bunch of yellow aircraft and red aircraft that are um, in the Chicago area and uh, you know, around the Chicago area. But as the day progresses, you start seeing that there are flights from Seattle to San Francisco or Seattle to LA, which have you know, 15 minutes or an hour of delay. For a day when the problem is pretty much isolated here. Right? Um, so why is this? Well, an aircraft that's flying from Chicago to Seattle that's an hour delayed, uh, 
it's not that it sits there and does nothing for the rest of the day. That aircraft is then going to probably fly maybe from, um, it flies from Chicago to Seattle, and then an hour later flies from Seattle to LAX. If you're an hour late getting into Seattle, you're going to be an hour late, or you know, depending on the schedule, at least somewhat delayed leaving Seattle, which means you're going to get delayed later and so on, and this propagates. That doesn't, so that's just the aircraft itself. The crews connect as well. So in fact, what you end up having is, well, your aircraft ends up delaying one of your flights. Your crew is, in fact, connecting to a flight. Maybe the crew is going from Seattle to Detroit, so the Seattle to Detroit flight is now delayed. And that doesn't even include the passengers, right? You could have 150 passengers on board, all going to different places, some of whom are going to miss their connections, and it's going to take them a long time to uh, get to where they're going. So I'll hope that this doesn't happen to any of us as we uh, travel uh, in the next two days. Um, but it is clear in these systems that delays propagate. So the logical question is, well, how do we model this? And really, networks seem like a natural abstraction to model this, right? So you have a lot of connectivity, and it seems like networks are right. And networks, as you all know, have been used to model a wide range of systems, inclu and including propagation effects. So propagation of rumors, propagation of epidemics. And this almost looks like a disease that's going from one airport to another. So it looks like an epidemic. Um, so historically, these models that exist, so sort of, you know, traditional network models, make a set of make some assumptions that don't quite translate to our um, particular context. So, for example, in epidemic models, you often assume that your node, our airport in this case, or a population in uh, a different case, um, belongs to a small subset of possible states. So for example, you could have it's susceptible, or it's infected, or it's recovered. Right? So there's a small subset. And this is really for computational tractability. Um, however, that doesn't quite work here, because if you think about delay levels, I really want that continuous delay level. There's the, you know, it's 15 minutes delayed, it's half an hour delayed, it's one hour delayed. And those impacts are very different. And I, I have a continuous gradation here that can happen in terms of um, the you know, the nodal state itself. Um, the second thing is that you typically assume that these interactions between different nodes are uh, very symmetric. So, you know, Chicago impacts New York exactly the same way as New York impacts Chicago. Whereas in this case, that's not true because um, not only can some airports, depending on the scheduling practices and which airlines are there, um, have disproportionately large impacts on others and not get impacted uh, inversely, um, so you have very asymmetric interactions, and these are certainly directed and weighted as well. And the third thing that's different is that traditionally you assume that the network structure, so how these airports relate to each other, or nodes that relate to each other, is static, whereas in this case, that's not true. Um, as I will show you in a few minutes, depending on when you look at it, this is really a time-varying network, and the connectivity between airports changes, partly because you know you have these um, flights that are going. So that sometimes you have flights, some other times you don't have flights. Sometimes an airport has bad weather. So San Francisco tends to have fog in the mornings, right? So that impact tends to be here in the mornings. So it really depends on how much connect what your connectivity looks like in the morning drives your connectivity of the delay impact through the rest of the day. For um, so going with those lessons in mind, we can start saying, OK, so what happens if we start trying to model air traffic delays during network, or using a network? And um, so one way of doing this is by saying that every edge, so you know, an edge between Chicago and JFK, I'm going to have a weight associated with it. And that weight is going to be the delay level that I see during that one hour, during some one hour period, right? So that's going to what uh, it's going to be. So my adjacency matrix, for example, um, I could have that at some period of time, I have uh, on, you know, the delay level between Chicago and Seattle is four minutes. Um, however, there's no inbound delay from Seattle to Chicago at that time. Similarly, Chicago is sending 20 minutes of delay on, you know, uh, on average to Atlanta, Atlanta is sending five minutes of delay to Seattle. And then we also see that, well, Atlanta could be sending only one minute of delay to uh, DFW, which is Dallas, Fort Worth, but getting five minutes of delay back and so on, right? So there's, uh, we can create, looking at the data, we can create a, 
uh, um, essentially a weighted directed network depending on what the situation looks like then. Um, this is just showing two different snapshots of, over two different periods of time, one hour time periods. Um, the red lines indicate links, the median delay on that link is 90 minutes, right? So it is not unusual to see that there are periods of time when you're going to have, if you take um, a flight that's going from one airport to another on average, so I'm choosing the median here, it's going to be 90 minutes delayed, right? So that's the kind of delay that's getting sent from one airport to another. Um, there are other, so this would be a period when at least looking at it, it seems like the Northeast is experiencing a lot of delays. This, on the other hand, would be, be a period of time when it looks like the issue might be in San Francisco because San Francisco seems to be a focal point of the delays. But once we have this, we can then try to build up. And with that picture abstraction, the question is, can we then build up a model of the dynamics? And so a very simplistic model of the dynamics that we start looking at and propose is, well, let's suppose that I have an adjacency matrix. So I look at it, and over that hour, I have this weighted this, uh, this network where every edge is weighted by what the delay level from one airport to another is. Uh, I can then come up with how the delays are likely to in, uh, evolve at every airport. And so my D in the I, the superscripts denote which airport it is. And what this is saying is, I'm going to say in my abstraction that the inbound delay at airport I at the next hour, at hour T plus one, has two possible, uh, two terms. One is, things don't die out instantaneously, right? You have congestion, you have delays, queues build up, and it's going to take some time for things to go out. So there is some factor, which I denote by alpha, which says that that's persistence. It's going to stay multiplied by whatever that delay level, inbound delay level was in the previous time step, plus everything that's getting pushed in here from other airports. So that's really related to the outbound delays from other airports that are coming into my airport. Similarly, my outbound delay is, has a term which is the persistence, which is saying that, well, if I was delayed at the last time period, I'm likely to stay for uh, a while more, plus a term which is saying, well, everybody else is pushing some fraction of their delays to me, and so that's, and the betas are telling us, well, how much, how susceptible are we to things that are happening in the rest of the system? So really, in terms of the two terms, each one, we have a persistence effect and a network effect. So. Uh, later on, I'll briefly talk about this, but when we validate these models and we learn those alphas and betas, there's a physical meaning here, right? Because the alphas being large means that once you're in trouble, you're going to stay, you tend to stay in trouble for a long time. The betas being large means that, a particular beta ij being large means that if that airport ha has high levels of delay, then I'm going to, I'm particularly susceptible to it. So that's not going to be good for me because it means that I'm going to get all, all of that delay soon. Um, so the state, then, in, in terms of our model, when we are trying to uh, propagate this dynamics, the state of our system is this vector which has all the outbound delays and all the inbound delays. So for every airport in the system, I have an inbound delay and an outbound delay, uh, which is the total inbound delay that's coming in and the total outbound delay that's uh, going out. Uh, and then with this dynamics, I can basically write this matrix equation, which says that if you give me a fixed network topology, if you tell me that those adjacency matrices and all those weights are constant, then really my evolution is um, looks like this, which is x bar at time t plus 1. So that entire state vector is going to be some massive matrix right, multiplied by this x bar uh, at time t, where this matrix depends on those alpha and beta parameters. And it also depends on this <coughs> matrix, which is the calligraphic A, which depends on the adjacency matrices, right? It looks, it's just this, um, often it's the, um, it's the block matrix with the A and the A transpose, the two adjacency matrices in the off di diagonal uh, elements. So what does this mean? So I, this is just writing, you know, under, this is just algebra, right? So I have that Topology, I say, okay, I'm going to propose this view of the dynamics, which seems reasonable, and then I can write this matrix form. But what in practice is happening is that this A is changing from one time to another, which means that this A, the calligraphic A is also changing from one time to another. So we need some other view of representing those changes. And so to do that, one thing is to say, well, what is the impact of that matrix? Of particular adjacency matrix on the dynamics of the system itself. Um, so more simply, we can ask the question, well, 
if you give me two possible adjacency matrices, what is, how do I tell if they're different, if they're significantly different or they're similar, right? So how do I uh, characterize them uh, in some way? So there are two ways we can do this. One is we can just say, well, what is the impact on the evolution of the state itself? And so one way of thinking about it is, um, well, these betas are, if all the betas were kind of similar, were similar and the alphas were all similar, I get something which looks like the state vector at time t plus one is this A matrix multiplied by the state vector at time t. So one way of separating when what happens when these A's are different from each other is to say, well, um, let me look at the eigenvector of that, this matrix, right? Because what this is saying is if I start at some period in, along that eigenvector of that matrix, of that curly A matrix, I'm going to stay in that space. My delays are going to be just stay similarly proportional throughout. So one way I can distinguish it is to just look at the principal eigenvector of this matrix. So in terms of the dynamics. This is also a problem that shows up in network theory where you, there are a bunch of network theoretic properties you could be looking at instead, right? Some centrality metric, for example, to see whether these, uh, these two networks or these two adjacency matrices are close together or they're very different. Um, Traditional eigenvector centrality works well when you have uh, an undirected network. So symmetry is a large part of the centrality metrics that you talk about. Um, but um, in the mid to um, late 90s, uh, Kleinberg uh, proposed for di directed networks, right? The idea that you can extend the centrality metric to one which is not a single centrality metric, but two, namely hubs and authorities. And the idea is that I, I will call a node a strong hub if it does a lot of pointing, so there's a lot of outbound arcs with heavy weights to a, several nodes, which are strong authorities. And what is a strong authority? A strong authority is one where a lot of strong hubs are pointing to that node. Right? So it's a cyclical thing, which is I become more important as a hub if I'm pointing to a lot of nodes that are important but of course, they become more important as authorities if a lot of important people are pointing to them, right? So that's the whole idea where to reinforce this. Um, the interesting thing about this is in 2013, Benzi and others showed that, well, if you want to find in these networks hub and authority scores, you can actually calculate it as the principal eigenvector of this matrix, which interestingly enough is exactly the same thing that we get when we compare uh, the dynamics as well, right? So that's good. At least you don't have two different orthogonal ways of thinking about it, whether you think about it from you know, looking at a, a centrality metric for directed graphs or whether you think about the dynamics. This is saying that, well, these hub and authority scores, that is the principal vector of this matrix, is one way in which I can distinguish adjacency matrices from other. The other way we could distinguish them is by just looking at those delay values, right? So some weighted, if the delays are really high, uh, what does it look like? What does it uh, um, look, um, you know, and when delays are really low, what does it look like? And the third way is the delay trends, which is at any time, because these are instantaneous snapshots, uh, it's good to have a indicator of am I, does the picture look like this while my delays in system wide are increasing, or does the picture look like this when my delays are decreasing? But based on this, we can come up with this feature vector, and what we can do is we can now say, well, we're going to cluster, right? We're going to group these different, all the different adjacency matrices, all the different networks that I see over the course of, you know, a year or two years. I'm going to group them and cluster them based on the feature vector which says, how close are, is this vector, which is a combination of the delays that I see at that time, the hub and authority scores which say something about the connectivity that I see at that time, and the delay trend that I see at that time. And when we do this, what we find is that um, it now gives us a notion of uh, a switched control system. So what do I mean by this? Well, if at any time you give me an adjacency matrix, I can decide what group it belongs to, right? And that group is like a mode of a switch system or a hybrid system. Now, once I have that matrix and I know that I'm in that mode, 
I know that my dynamics is fixed because it's basically that equation that I had earlier, right? the linear equation that I had earlier. So I have linear dynamics under this mode, and then at some point I have a mode switch, and then I have linear dynamics under that mode, and then I have a mode switch, and then this keeps going on and on. And these mode switches, you know, we can treat as random because it's getting triggered by weather, it's getting tr triggered by decisions people are making in the system, but I can now say I have a Markov jump linear system, and I can identify this Markov jump linear system model. Now, the nice thing is once we identify this model, we can have something where we can start asking questions and start analyzing it, right? Um, so the first thing is what does real data, put it in here, what do the modes look like, right? Those different adjacency matrices. Um, so this is just an example, this is a result, I guess, of looking at a year of data and clustering based on the different uh, dynamics that we see, and this is these are the centroids of those clusters. So let me explain quickly. Um, each of these is sort of these labels that I'm giving are qualitative labels, right? So I'm going to call this a San Francisco increasing mode because well, I look at it and it looks like San Francisco is seems to be the focal point of the delays, and the delays were increasing at that time. This one again, San Francisco is the focal point of the delays, but the delays are decreasing. Um, so there's the San Francisco mode. Right, either increasing or decreasing. There's one which is what we call high NAS because it's pretty clear that the delay values anywhere in the system wide are really, really high. There's one that's low NAS, right? And uh, I'm not going to show it here, but this happens overnight, right? The system resets overnight invariably, so you don't have demand, you tend to have uh, low NAS modes overnight. Then you have Atlanta is in trouble, Chicago is in trouble, and then you have the sort of moderate state where uh, you know everybody is halfway going up or halfway going down. So we have 12 modes that we identify, and for each of these modes we have this linear dynamics. These gammas are those big matrices that I showed earlier, and then you have this transition probability which says that uh, for the Markov jumps, right? So at any time I have some probability that I'm going to transition from the mode that I'm in to the next mode. And the one other thing that we've noticed is in some of these states when you um, somebody does something, uh, like the FAA takes a decision and there is a mode transition, it comes with a reset in terms of delays too because they do it by just grounding a whole bunch of flights, then you're injecting delays into your system so you can have these continuous state resets that tend to happen as well. But what we can do is we have this model for how these things propagate, and so the next question is what does the model tell us and can we validate this model? Um, so the first natural question to ask is sort of a stability. Uh, um, is the system working? It, it's almost a sanity check at this point, right? So the physical interpretation is I know that over time if I kept running this, do the systems, uh, do delays tend to decay or grow? And we know that overnight they tend to decay, so we believe that there is a notion of stability. Um, also, it's a stochastic system, right? It's a Markov jump linear system, so you can talk about either mean stability or almost sure stability, and we have some relationship between the two. Uh, I'm going to talk about almost sure stability here, which is saying that any realization that I see with probability one is going to decay as uh, time progresses. And so what we can do is we can derive conditions for the stability of Markov jump linear systems with those continuous state resets and these uh, time-varying transition matrices. Yeah. Sure. Are they also coming through the data? Yes. So I'm going to talk about that and why they're really important in the next slide. Right? It's a good question. Yeah. So we have this model which seems to be like a uncontrolled dynamics. Yeah. Where does the control come from? Right now there is no control. And I'll talk about the issue when we talk about control. So uh, that's a very good point because I'm assuming that all state transitions are random and I they they're entirely uh, their influence, right? There's an oracle sitting there, whoever it is. A bunch of people making a decision, whether it decides to come in, whatever, it's just uh, there. All I'm doing is I'm learning that. So I'm outside and I'm going to, the transition probabilities when I learn them is going to tell me how that coin flip is happening. It's, in reality, it's not necessarily a coin flip, right? It's weather and it's people's decisions. So yeah, the, one of the things that we're beginning to work on now is if I can control it, what would the right control lobby, right, which, which is the logical thing. So we are not there yet. We are at the stage where I'm learning the model and I'm validating the model, but once I know it, then the next question is, can I make it do what I want it to do? 
Um, but going to the probabilities, well, the, this one other thing that I should talk about, even though I think anybody who's taken a hybrid systems class will laugh at this, um, which is the dynamics within a mode, right? You can ask, are they all stable? Or are they, you know, what do they look like? As one would expect, well, some modes are stable and some modes are not, right? And in particular, um, we notice that the increasing system delay modes are significantly more unstable than, this is just the spectral radius of that A matrix, right? The maximum uh, largest eigenvalue. And uh, the decreasing um, delay modes are mostly stable or at least, you know, close to marginally stable as it turns out. But of course, when you have switching between modes, the stability of these uh, individual modes is neither necessary nor sufficient for the stability of the entire system. You could be switching between unstable modes and becoming stable. You can be switching between stable modes and becoming unstable. But it does say something about, you know, sanity check on, um, in the low NAS, if I'm going to stay there and there's no impact, you would expect that delay should die down. And in fact, we do find that they're going to die down pretty fast. Um, so with the transition matrix, so we have to learn this transition matrix, right? And so the first thing we can do is consider an average transition matrix, which is uh, over the, for, I take all the periods, one hour periods I have over a course of an hour, of a year, and I ask, from this hour to the next, what is the transition matrix between trans going from one mode to the other? And this is just, you know, color coded in terms of you see that it's very heavy along the diagonals because you tend to stay in the same mode. So the dwell times are reasonably high, but then you also have certain patterns on moving one way or the other. It turns out that if you plug this in into the jump linear system model and the conditions for it, the system is not stable. Right? So this is, so delays will not decay over the course of a day with this model. So that sort of takes us, you know, we're a little taken aback. But there's one thing we're missing out, which is that these transition matrices are absolutely not uh, constant through the whole day, right? So this is just, I'm going to visualize that same idea, but what it looks like if I actually condition by what time of the day it is, starting at 5 a.m. in the East Coast. And you see that this matrix, the way it looks, the pattern is very different because in the morning I tend to be moving from the decree, you know, decreasing delay modes to increasing delay modes uh, early in the morning, and then as it gets later in the evening, I start moving into the decreasing delay modes again. So in fact, the transition matrices themselves are changing with time um, because demand changes with time and weather impacts are correlated with time as well. So there's a strong temporal pattern that you see in the transition matrices. So then if you consider that, the fact that the transition matrices themselves are time varying, you find that in fact this, the model, you can show that the system is in fact stable. So the, the takeaway for us here seems to be that the, when those mode switches happen is a critical uh, driver of the behavior, right? The system is being stabilized by the temporal variations in those transition probabilities, which then again motivates that um, the control question even more because it's saying that if in fact the system is naturally seems to be stabilizing itself by moving to certain modes at certain times, then as an en engineers, if you can trigger those mode transitions, we absolutely should be thinking about the optimal transitions if we could force some of these transitions to get there at the right times, right, in the best way possible. Um, so then the next question is the validation of this. So. Um, this is a fairly simple model, right? So there's no reason why this should, uh, quite honestly, I go in here and I say there's no reason why this should be anywhere representative of what happens in reality. Um, how, so what we do is we learn the model from using the data from 2011, and then in 2012, we basically restart and we say, okay, for every day, what do I think the day's progression is going to be like in terms of delays? And there are different things I can look at. I can look at the total system delay, right? And I can also look at individual airports over the course of the day, how does it vary? So in each of these plots, uh, on the left, this is the total system delay. The um, red is the actual d delay that was seen, and then there is, uh, it's over the course of the year. So different days, you know, it's a stochastic system, right? Different days, there are different realizations. So that's the standard deviation that you see. And the blue is what the model, if you simulated the model, if you just let, let, let the model run through what it would predict. And we see that there is actually a really good match between what happens in the model and the actual. Um, the model's a little slow, so 
Um, it's except when the delays start going down again, the model is a little slow in realizing that, oh, delays are going to start decaying and predicting that the decaying delays. And one of the, uh, our hypothesis for why this is happening is we, we have those increasing and decreasing delay trends, but we're running with a model which basically has six modes, right? And if you want six modes to represent everything that's happening in the system, we're not, we're not um, of high enough fidelity there to get it uh, to capture the more transitions that are happening when, to the decreasing delay modes. But that said, you know, we're close enough that I think this says this is a good model and it's actually reasonably predictive of um, the way the system actually uh, behaves. Right. So then we can go. Yes, Roshna. Let me understand this. Uh, so you are saying that you can predict the Yes, so what this is saying is that over the course of time, right, this, the, de the delay is likely to be maximum around 8 p.m., okay. right? So now this is sort of a cumulative representation over the whole year? This is the cumulative presentation of the whole year, which is why the... I bet you this is going to be very different in winter time. Absolutely, absolutely. Time. Okay, so sure yes, so valid enough. So the reason we stick to aggregates here is precisely because the mechanical delays are one-off. So nothing, I mean, the first thing I would say is that this entire model is not going to miss anything that's not systemic. Unless it's something that has slammed the entire airport, okay. it is not going to, it, this is not a good model to predict what's going to happen to an individual flight. Right. This is only going to be good if I want to know how bad is an airport going to be in the evening. Absolutely. Okay. Now, I, I, absolutely. So this is that's why I said you know I'm looking at delay levels. I'm looking at median. I'm not even looking at mean. Right. I'm putting a median in there. Absolutely. So that's a good point. The second thing about the nonlinearity is there are nonlinearities here, and the question really becomes. Do you gain, and I, I don't have a good answer or intuition to this, do you gain more by keeping the number of discrete modes and making it a nonlinear system with the same number of discrete modes, or do you gain more by having larger number of discrete modes which has more connectivity that pictures, but keeping a linear model? And I think my intuition and my, my guess is that you're probably better off, the linear model does good enough to figure out the aggregate effects in terms of the propagation. You're better off getting more pictures of the connections between airports. So I would say it's the way I would deal with the nonlinearity is to say that, oh, I can have different adjacency matrices, but I, I don't have a good proof of that. Right? Yeah. Um, so, yes and no. So it depends on what we're trying to do. So one of the things we can do is we can do clustering and, you know, some variant of clustering to figure out the type of day. So we've done work on the type of day. The type of days do really well in aggregate in saying that this place is bad. It ends up being not good enough to say that this is the delay level at that particular airport. Right? But if all I want is... At 8 p.m., which is going to be my worst airport? 
then my best indicator is going to be what type of day is it, right? for which I do not have to do this. Right? But if you ask me, at 8 p.m., I have this type of day, what is the weather going to be? Then what I would do is I would basically temper those transition matrices depending on the type of day. I would condition them based on what type of day it is to get that prediction. Right? So there are two different things, which is if the question is all I want is system-wide what the aggregate picture is going to look like, system-wide, I don't have to do this. Absolutely. So um, I think that will actually, um, I'm going to skip this. This is just those alphas and betas. So one of the things I was going to point out is um, this, which is we, c we have shown that if you know what the delay state, right? this is the equivalent of just what does that adjacency matrix look like now. That is actually a really good indicator of individual things later on. Right? It's a good predictor. But you don't, if all I want is a delay level for a node, the, if the question is, I want the delay level for a node. I don't care about the individual delay states um, on each link. Then there's multiple, way I could just use that model. It's a simpler model than trying to train something to predict each variable separately. And then if I want something which is just aggregate which one is really bad, all I need is a type of day. Right? So there's that full scale. Um, so, and then there's different things that we can do with this model. One is actually say, yeah, it's finite time behavior we care about. So there's the whole finite time behavior question that we can ask, which is not asymptotic uh, stability, but how long does it take to die down, which is a more interesting question depending on, you know, because it's a short-term problem, right? I need to know if it's going to take two hours or it's going to take three hours. So I, I need to know that. Uh, I think the second piece is the uh, problem that I talked about, you know, uh, that Mo had asked, which is, if I can identify what triggers these transitions, and that becomes a question of, can we establish causality between things we do and the way the system responds? But if I can establish causality, then uh, I think the logical question to ask is, if I have a system which occasionally is going to have some level of random transitions, but I can also force transitions by saying that if the FAA does this, then it pushes it to this particular mode, then what is the right sequence, the switching controller essentially for these systems, right, to make it behave in a particular way. Um, and then really where we want to go with this is, and I, where the network abstraction is good, is more complicated networks because it gives us a way. We can start thinking about how delays react with demand, how de delays react with cancellations and things get really bad how delays react with weather impacts as well, right? So you can think about multi-layer networks where delay is not the only dynamics you're thinking of, but having that kind of model becomes easier because you're just piecing together multiple layers with interactions. So uh, I think if you can show for one layer that it's a good representation, then it's a good abstraction for us to get more complicated. And one of the things that we're trying to think about is interactions between um, demand you know, for taxi service and airport delays, right? There's clearly uh, strong uh, um, coincidence, uh, correlations there. And an example I was going to point out is, you know, two years ago, uh, it's on a snowstorm in Atlanta. The airport gets cleared, but nobody's, all these delays, there are no flights flying out because, in fact, you can't get to the airport, right? So if you have congestion and, you know, uh, a traffic jam around the airport, then your crews can't get in. And that's not a crew can't get in for that one flight. It's that crews can't get in for any of your flights. And then you have a systemic problem. So I think we can capture it. This, will, this kind of model will never get the onset of delays because you know, something failed. But 15 minutes after the runway shuts down because of the disabled aircraft, this when it's... really the future of networks, yeah. um, of transportation networks. You know, Absolutely, because ultimately, I think as a passenger, I only care about getting from point A to point B. I don't care about how you get me there, right? I just want to, I want to get to Berkeley. I don't care about whether it's San Francisco and cab or Oakland and cab, so absolutely. Um, so in the next five minutes, 
All right. Uh, in the next few minutes, I, I want to talk a little bit about a different thing on the actual planning, the full-scale uh, planning problem that we've been working on. Um, so here again, it's a different kind of, uh, you know, impacts propagate. So this is uh, flight tracks from a day when the weather is all in the New York area. So these are thunderstorm cells in green and yellow. Uh, each of these is an aircraft with a five-minute history behind it. And we see that as the storm moves closer and blocks these, reduces capacity here, you start having these holding patterns. And you can have holding patterns halfway through the country. And then, you know, once the storm moves south, you have holding patterns all the way down to uh, Florida for, you know, a capacity impact that's happening at a very localized place, right? So the airspace is getting uh, completely blocked off, and that is propagating through the system as well. Um, so fundamentally here, it's one of resource allocation, the problem. And the question is, um, every airport has um, some capacity. You have a set of runways. You can use them for arrivals or departures. And these, there's a trade-off between how many arrivals you can get in and how many departures you can get in. So there are these uh, trade-off envelopes, which tell us you know, what the capacity of the airport is. And that envelope depends on what the weather is. If it's one, it's bigger if there's good weather, but then if you have poor weather, then you can you reduce the entire envelope. So this is an uncertain thing which drives your uh, available capacity of airport resources. On the airspace side, you again have, you know, your airspace is divided into smaller regions, and these are, there's a maximum number of aircraft that you can have in a given region. That depends on, you know, the shape of the sector, the, that piece is called a sector. So it depends on the shape of it. It depends on the traffic patterns around there. It depends on the workload of air traffic controllers. So there's a whole bunch of um, uncertain factors that drive that as well. Um, so this problem of, OK, how do you do resource allocation here is an old one. And it's made really hard because of two things. One is that you don't know what those capacities are many hours in advance. Um, the second is. It's a crazy amount of connectivity again, and this is that aircraft-to-aircraft -aircraft connectivity that uh, Rujana mentioned. It turns out that in the U.S. at least, only about 6% of aircraft just fly one flight a day and they're done, right? There's like a few tail out here which fly 11, 12 flights a day. They're going somewhere and they're coming back. But, you know, on average, they're flying somewhere between four and six flights a day. And the problem with this in terms of an optimization problem is that it makes, if I say I'm going to be myopic and do something that is optimal for the next two hours or three hours, it can be a terrible decision for the rest of the day. It might be, you know, there's nobody on this flight right now, so I can cancel it. But if that aircraft was then doing five other flights which were fully booked, then I've made a decision to cancel a flight, and I've actually made a decision implicitly to carry or cancel the next six flights, right, the next five flights. And so that makes the optimization problem itself hard. Um, so th this is a classic problem of, you know, 1980s, uh, Amadeo Odoni had the first mathematical formulation of this. And I'm going to deal, since I'm already out of time, I'm going to focus on the uh, deterministic case. And the question is this, which is, um, you have a set of flights. I know those aircraft have to fly, each aircraft has to operate a certain number of flights. I have some prediction of the capacities of my airspace and airports, um, can I actually plan a trajectory in order to um, satisfy all these operational constraints, but also be optimal in terms of the benefit that I get, right, uh, maximizing it. Now, the variant of this, the stochastic variant would be I have a set of possible scenario trees and of all the profiles, capacities that can happen, and I want to optim maximize the expected profit that I would get satisfy the operational constraints no matter which scenario materializes, because a lot of the constraints are safety ones. So what constraints do we have? Well, we have those resource capacity constraints, so the airspace and airport sector capacity constraints. Then you have physics constraints, right? So it takes me a minimum amount of time to land one flight and then get everybody off that flight and new people on that flight and have that. So that's called the turnaround time and so for flights that connect. And then I can't fly faster than some, you know, whatever the maximum allowable speed is, and I can't slow down. I can't stop an aircraft midair. So I have maximum and minimum transit times uh, in terms of these aircraft. Um, what can I do in terms of control actions? Well, not very much. You can delay them. Where can you delay them? You can delay them on the ground before they take off, che relatively cheap. 
You can delay them in the air. They're burning fuel, and it's not good for workload, so more expensive. You can delay them by having them fly a longer path, so also expensive, requires more coordination. And you can delay them so much that the airline just says, forget about it and cancel it, right? So that's an incredible amount of delay. So there's, you can delay it, and it's only a question of how much and where in terms of these flights. Um, so okay. Um, what we come up with is we look at the trajectory, and we are going to treat this as a discrete time uh, optimization problem. So really, uh, a trajectory is uh, discrete in both time and space. Um, I'm going to go through a set of nodes. So I take my entire network and I discretize it every region of airspace like a sector. I have different places where I can enter and different places where I can leave. I might have nodes in between two. So I discretize my entire airspace and I discretize my entire um, time interval, right? And so I then get a sequence of node time con uh, combinations which are going to give me the trajectory of a flight. And I can use this to write uh, essentially optimization problem. Um, I'm not going to go through the math. So the idea is going to be you want to maximize the total profit or benefit out of those trajectories. You want to make sure that every aircraft, you only select one trajectory. You want to satisfy all your sector capacity constraints. You want to satisfy your airport capacity constraints. And then you want to have a binary variable saying which trajectory you picked. So a trajectory for an aircraft here is going to be something like leave airport A at this time, fly at this speed, you know, the entire route till the next airport says spend 45 minutes at that airport turning it down, then fly the next flight, this route, and so on. So it's the entire path for the entire day is the trajectory that we look at. Um, so this is a very large scale uh, integer program. But the nice thing about the way we've set it up is uh, we can solve it using dual decomposition or column generation, depending on what language you speak. Uh, same thing. right? And the nice thing is that the a uh, restricted master problem that you solve, we solve the LP relaxation for, and we can show some very nice heuristics to assess the gap and the show that you actually get close to the optima to, uh, close to optimality. The other nice thing is that the subproblems in the dual decomposition um, are basically longest path problems on directed acyclic graphs. So you can solve these extremely efficiently and fast using dynamic programming. And the nice thing from the uh, implementation point of view is you're solving this separately for every aircraft, right, uh, independently. And it's because you can decompose it that way, no airline needs to send a lot of information to the centralized decision maker. You basically are publishing prices for all your resources. The airlines are making their own decisions for their own sets of aircraft and then pushing back basically updates that they have uh, to their plans. So that uh, it's really good in terms of parallel implementation. Um, this is just a pictorial version of that with the master program saying that uh, I'm going to then um, push prices for each of the airspace and airport resources at each time. The subproblems are solved, and then they push back, and then you iterate on this till you can show something about how close to optimality you are. Um, the nice thing overall is that using this, we're now able to solve problems that are you know, nationwide scale. So um, the, these are about 100 times fa um, bigger than problems that have been previously solved uh, in about half the time. right? So we're able to solve, essentially, system-wide problems in about five minutes. And this is on uh, uh, essentially a laptop with uh, eight virtual cores. Right? Um, we actually then say, OK, what about the future of this? So you can now have um, data sets from the FAA on what they think the airspace is going to look like in 2030. So here you have like 77,000 flights, about 40,000 flights that are manned uh, airline flights uh, with a bunch of capacities and all those other constraints. And then you have unmanned flights that are uh, you know, flying various missions and range of altitudes, right? Some of these are communication missions. Some of them are agriculture, uh, fish spotting missions. So there's this data set. And they have weird missions as well, where they're not doing shortest path from A to B. They're going and they want to spend three hours essentially circling over some region that they're doing some uh, agricultural uh, surveys of. And so problems that are the massive like this, we basically have now an implementation on a 40 core machine on AWS. I'm going to hopefully play that. 
And here we can actually do one minute trajectory fidelity um, and solve this in under four minutes, right? And if you're willing to do a rolling horizon with overlap, you can solve these problems in under a minute. Um, so the red aircraft are all the unmanned aircraft. As I said, there's a lot of unmanned demand in the set, mostly you know off the Atlantic doing surveillance um, for uh, fish, uh, fishing. Um, and then you have the blue aircraft that are going to the you know, various parts of the US and the Caribbean, which are manned aircraft. But you can solve these problems now like rem remarkably fast, right? So the idea is you can use this. One of the things, we have, two things. One of them you can use it for is um, to project what things are going to be like under different conditions and different uh, um, objective functions and you know different stakeholders. The other is, uh, as I said early on, we're commercializing some of this in terms of predicting delays. And this is the level of fidelity where if the first aircraft is delayed because of a mechanical issue and you want to know what is going to happen, you want to simulate the rest of the system doing this with that one aircraft there. So uh, part of what we're doing is this is the underlying sim uh, optimization engine for a prediction for passengers right, on whether your flight's going to be delayed or not. Um, so I'm going to not do this. right? Uh, um, I'm, I'm just going to end with some, you know, where, where the challenges are when we've done this. And I really think that the challenges, even in the autonomy side, are increasingly, for me, the interesting problems are in the integration. So, um, quite a question. So, this is an actual New York Times headline, right? On an unmanned, well, unpiloted flight from Canada, Newfoundland to uh, Oxfordshire, right? Pilot didn't touch the controls. When did this happen? Forty-seven, close enough, right? <laughs> so, I, for me, the remarkable thing about this flight has been that there were actually observers on board, like newspaper people willing to be on an unmanned aircraft. That's pretty brilliant. Uh, so, and and I also point out that they not only saw drone warfare, but they actually also said that you know Amazon Prime Air was coming, right, in forty-seven, like seventy years ago. Um, but so as you know, we've kind of known how to solve the one aircraft doing, you know, flying on its own uh, piece for a while now. What we don't know is how do you do it when there's a whole lot of other stuff going on, including man traffic, right? So a lot of the challenge that's there is not the one aircraft. It's um, really the integration problem. And then, you know, there's, again, it's the system problems like how do you integrate manned and unmanned or even man unmanned and unmanned when you know things, uh, uh, random things can happen. There's issues of fairness because if you have these network systems in air traffic control, all fairness is first come first serve right now. But if you actually have you know network constraints, it's not clear that the if you decide that every resource is going to be first come first serve, you're going to be incredibly inefficient. So the question is, how do you give some guarantees of fairness in network systems? And I think there are a lot of open questions there. Um, there are questions on incentives. I mean, how do you make sure that when you ask for airlines to tell you what their delay costs are or what their preferences are, how do you know they're going to report at all, and how do you incentivize them to tell you the truth? So there's those mechanism design questions as well. Uh, and then privacy. So one of the reasons nobody wants to share any information is uh, that you know everybody is it's a competitive environment, right? So my if I tell you that this particular flight for me for my airline is really worth a lot. In some sense, I'm telling you that I have my medallion member who's there, right? So is, uh, there's uh, clear implications there as well. Um, the other thing is security, because we're now moving to a system where we're sharing more information and we're making more decisions out of onboard data we're getting from other aircraft, which then means we got to wonder, well, you know, how do we make these decisions robust to malicious data, bad data, you know, um, errors, and so on. So there's the security aspects of it, and if you're going to start, you know, making decisions in terms of routing based on surveillance. Uh, so I think, and then there's the interactions question, which brings it back to the first one, which is how do humans interact with the decision support? How do humans interact with the unmanned systems? Um, things that you do, you know, like in the electricity markets, you know, you have the um, the spot market versus the day ahead. There's the equivalent of that, where you can do demand management of air, air traffic resources 
months ahead or days ahead, and then there's weather sets in and you're doing this reallocation. So how do these different control mechanisms inter interact with each other? And then as I mentioned earlier, you know, you have the interactions between road and uh, rail and uh, air as well, because ultimately passengers just want to go from one place to another. So uh, I'll stop there. This is basically where I started with saying that I think we can build really effective algorithms and make them work, but really it becomes really important for us not just look at the cyber physical components, but also what the, the randomness that comes in because of the human elements as well. So uh, thank you very much. Yeah, so in this model, that is sort of implicit because there would only be propagation if two things happened. One is that there was actually mass flow and that there was actually, that mass flow was getting delayed, right? Both have to happen. Um, when I talked about the multi-layer network, so one of the things that we've done separately is to say you have the mass flow on one layer and you have the delay impact on the other layer and you have a connection between these two, right? So um, the demand, we've done some work looking at the relationship between the way delays propagate and the mass, but in this model that I showed, it's implicit in there, where the delay can only propagate if there is demand. So, which is why the temporal variations that I showed, so that some modes tend to occur at certain times, it's not just a function of the weather, right? The stronger temporal pattern is in the demand. So in, in this, my, my, uh, I guess my thing is, in this model, the way we've learned it, if you have a strong correlation between those two, there is a very good chance that it actually, and, and that pattern is being seen consistently, then it's only going to show up in this model if there was actually a significant mass flow between those airports. In um, some early work that we've done recently, we actually come up with, Let's suppose that it's a certain fraction of the mass flow, and then you look at the mass flow fraction and you map those parameters to this, right? But in this, it's only going to show up. The mass flow is a given. Otherwise, it's not going to show up here. Right. Yes. Back to the simple question. You said that you were starting to think about this, this part, um, but it seems like, for example, if the controls were to delay flights or cancel flights, um, that, seems to, that seems to be a decision up to the airlines. So how could the FAA, for example, like an, any kind of government body make, make people do that? Is this through economics, for example? Or? So I think one way, delaying flights is something that airlines, uh, that the system operator can do, okay. right? Which is if I crank down the capacity, because the system operator, so the FAA gets to make a call on the capacity, right? I can say that I'm only going to allow in the next 45 minutes 10 aircraft to land. And implicitly, I have introduced a level of delay. And when they make that decision, they sort of do a back of the envelope calculation to see how much delay they're injecting. Delay is easy, right? To, easy as in, they're going to get, it's not that people don't complain, but they can do it. There is a way to inject delay into the system. Um, usually, if those delays, airlines have this rule of thumb where if they get delayed more than four hours, they're going to start, the odds that they're going to cancel are fairly high, right? Um, so when it gets bad enough, it gets can cancel, uh, canceled. Um, and we do see a correlation between really bad days that, you know, if you do the same kind of clustering but with cancellations, you see generally correlation. The reason is generally is there are certain events where you see very low delays. So in the middle of hurricanes, this method, the mass flow question comes there. So in the middle of a hurricane, like the days when the weather is really bad somewhere, you'll see zero delays in Houston in the middle of a hurricane. But you'll see a 100% cancellation rate. Right? They've canceled 100 flights. Nobody's delayed. Right? That works pretty well. So the, and that's the thing with the mass flow, which is you, if there's no mass flow there, it's possible that it's significantly impacted, but you're not going to see it here unless you were also measuring the demand that's scheduled and what's been canceled. 
Um, so yeah, they can, they can shut down an airport and cancel temporary cancellations. They won't do it because they figure the airline should make the call of a particular flight whether they're going to cancel it or not. But the rule of thumb that you know, everybody uses is after four hours, the odds get very high, right? So, thank you.